The first verse of Genesis tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and light. That was day one. On day two, God separated the sky from the oceans. Day three was devoted to making land, trees, plants and fruit. On day four came the sun, moon and stars. And God saw it was good. On day five, God got a bit more detailed and made all the sea creatures and all the birds of the air. On the sixth day came wild animals. And finally, in God's own image, God made humans. <laughs> and on the seventh day, God rested, as you know. That's Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter 2 is a summary of Genesis chapter 1. If the word summary means telling a completely different story. Right, so, before the Lord God made heaven and earth, before the plants and animals and anything else, God made a man. <laughs> and the Lord planted a garden in the east, which God called Eden, and placed the man there. The Lord made a variety of trees in the garden. And in the center of the garden, God planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the Lord said, you may eat the fruit of any of these trees that I've planted here for you, but do not eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. Huh? Uh. 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 Huh? Uh. Oh. And so Adam was put in charge of the garden, and it was his to enjoy. <laughs> The first thing Adam did was to find out what was good to eat in the garden. He discovered that grapes were delicious. Oh. He found corn to be delightful. And he established that porcupines were not, in fact, fruit. <laughs> As part of his duties in the garden, Adam was charged with the important task of naming all the animals. Zebra. Alligator. <laughs> Gazelle. Adam began his work with great enthusiasm. Ooh. <laughs> he even brought a certain poetic flair to the task. Hippopotamus. Piping plover. Caribou. But after several hours of naming, Adam became fatigued and the quality of his work dropped off significantly. Huh. Bat, cow, hamster, duck. Adam found that, as the only human being, he was very lonely. Adam asked the Lord why, when all the animals had partners, he did not. The Lord heard Adam's lament and responded, putting him into a deep sleep. The Lord extracted a rib from Adam's chest. And from the rib, God made woman. <laughs> and so Adam and his mate Eve got along very well. They enjoyed their days and nights in Eden until
One day, while out walking, Eve came upon the tree of knowledge. Ah. Eve was quite impressed with the size and beauty of the tree and stopped to admire it. Ah. The serpent, who had been waiting for this moment, suggested Eve might try one of the tree's sweet, juicy, delectable, looking fruit. Adam and Eve rarely remembered what they'd had for breakfast, but they did manage to remember the one rule God had imposed on them. Don't eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge, or you will die. <coughs> but the desire to have that which she did not proved too powerful to resist. She then handed the fruit to Adam, who happily ate it. Though nothing stirred around them, it was clear that something had changed. Most notably, was the realization that they were nude. <laughs> Adam wondered where his pants were, <laughs> and also what pants were. Uh... At that moment, God happened to be walking through the garden. In a panic, the couple sought to cover and hide themselves. <laughs> God called out to them. Adam acknowledged hearing the Lord but explained that he had hidden out of shame for his nakedness. God inquired who had told them they were naked. Um. The Lord asked if they had eaten the fruit of knowledge. Adam blamed Eve. <gasps> Eve blamed the serpent. <gasps> and the serpent seemed indifferent. God cursed the serpent, condemning it to crawl on its belly and eat dirt. Adam and Eve knew all too well the punishment for eating the fruit. They were to die. But God did not kill them. Instead, as punishment, God made their lives significantly more difficult. God decreed that Eve would now suffer terrible pain in childbirth. Eve wasn't sure what childbirth was but she now knew that she wasn't looking forward to it. God also told Eve, she shall be ruled over by her husband. Oh. God told Adam that he would now have to sweat and labor to grow the food he eats. Oh. <laughs> All the days of his life, until he returns to the ground from which God had made him. <laughs> <laughs> And so God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden forever. The cherubs were posted as a guard, preventing them from returning to the garden. The consequences of their actions were plain. They had lost their innocence, they had lost paradise, and broken their special relationship with the Lord. And yet hope remained. They had been allowed to live. And so it would seem that while God had banished them from Eden, they were not banished from God. Life after the flood was not kind to Noah. His children harassed him. God had stopped giving him personal instructions, and all of his friends were gone. What was there to do? Noah, like everyone else in his time, was the great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchild of Adam and Eve. The first to ever disobey God. <laughs> Most people, like their great, 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 great grandparents, continued this trend of disobedience. Noah, however, was the exception. Not much is known about Noah's early life, but being that he grew up as an obedient and righteous follower of God, 
in a time where rampant impiety was very much in vogue. Hey, Noah, what you doing? You praying? One could assume he had some difficulty relating to his peers. Weirdo. And most likely kept to himself. The world Noah grew up in was a violent and lawless place. So violent, in fact, that God had become thoroughly disgusted with creation and had decided to make a fresh start by flooding the entire earth. God told Noah to make an ark and also told Noah to bring two of every kind of animal, male and female, from the smallest to the largest. Those on the ark on the day of the flood would be saved. The rest would perish. Noah's faith was strong. He didn't question the instruction and immediately set to work. Crowds came from all around to mock Noah and his little project. A hundred and twenty years passed in this way, with Noah maintaining absolute focus on building the ark. Meanwhile, humanity continued to fight, sin, and generally misbehave all around him. Despite his faith in the Lord, Noah was still astonished to see so many animals of so many different varieties, several of which were clearly not native to the area. In fact, the ark was becoming quite crowded, so Noah had to be a bit more discerning as to who was allowed on the ark. Can we come to? Finally, Noah boarded with his family and waited for God to shut the ark's door and for the rain to begin. A week passed. If there was a moment in which Noah's faith wavered, this was it. But then, the Lord shut the door of the ark as promised, and finally it began to rain, and the waters rose, covering the mountains. It soon became apparent that Noah had agreed to much more than he'd bargained for. As the trip wore on, tempers grew short, and Noah found himself thrust into the role of mediator, a role for which he was, at best, socially disadvantaged. After 40 days, God remembered Noah and the rain stopped. After 150 days, the water subsided. As Noah set foot on dry land, he then fully realized the gravity of God's flood. Ooh. Noah suddenly felt profoundly sad and alone. Noah built an altar to God out of gratitude for being spared from the flood. It might have seemed a bit strange having brought the animals through the flood only to sacrifice a few of them afterwards. But the Lord had redefined the covenant with humankind and now gave Noah permission to eat everything that lives and moves, 
not just the plants and fruits that were given to Adam. Noah's sacrifice pleased God. God spoke to Noah and promised to never again destroy life on earth. God then put a rainbow in the sky to signify this new arrangement. As time passed, Noah found himself laying in the fields all day, staring at the sky utterly and completely alone, a question gnawing at him, until one day he looked up and asked, Lord, you are called compassionate, so why weren't you more forgiving of your creation? But there was no reply. In that silence, Noah turned the question onto himself. In the 120 years it took to build the ark, could he not have tried to relay God's message to someone, anyone? <coughs> Noah became tortured by this thought and the guilt that it carried. For he now saw that despite the flood, <coughs> sin had survived in him. Noah wasn't the leader that Abraham or Moses would be, but he did salvage the seeds of our world. And for this, he remains a hero of the Old Testament. Abram, Son of Terah lived in the region of Haran with his beautiful wife, Sarai. Together, they led a rather unremarkable life. But that morning, God appeared to Abram and told him to leave his country, his people, his father's household and go to a land to be revealed later. The Lord promised many blessings in return. Okay. Abram attempted to explain the relocation plan to Sarai. Uh... Since he had no concrete details on the purpose or value of the move, uh -huh. this proved rather difficult. Regardless, Abram and Sarai packed up all of their belongings and left for the land of Canaan. But upon arrival, they found the land engulfed in famine and the local climate less than ideal and the bounty promised was nowhere to be seen. Fortunately, God returned to clarify a few things. The Lord explained that this land would be given to Abram's children. Childless and well past their prime, Abram and Sarai wondered what they would do until the increasingly unlikely event of offspring occurred. Because of the famine, they decided to follow their stomachs and set out for Egypt. Okay. Just outside of Egypt, a grim thought suddenly occurred to Abram. Abram found Sarai to be alarmingly beautiful. Might not the men of Egypt see this foreign temptress and immediately be filled with desire? And might that desire be so intense that they would murder her husband? He knew God was supposed to be with him, but he couldn't take any chances. So Abram introduced Sarai as his sister. Pharaoh fell for their ruse, proving even too effective. Abram, may I have your blessing to take your beautiful sister as my wife? Oh. Uh, okay. Sarai was rather annoyed by this development, noting that so far, neither Abram's faith or lack thereof had created much for desirable circumstances. There were numerous perks to being the pharaoh's brother-in-law. He received sheep, camels, servants, 
However, the rest of Pharaoh's household did not fare as well under the deceitful arrangement. The Lord engulfed the line of Pharaoh in pestilence and disease. Knowing that she was to blame, Sarai, Abram's my husband, <laughs> eventually told the truth. Pharaoh was none too pleased. For years, Sarai and Abram had attempted to conceive, but to no avail. Without children, Abram could not receive the Lord's bounty. Sarai suggested Abram bed with her handmaiden, Hagar, to expedite the process. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. 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 The plan was a success. Abram was given his first son, Ishmael. Though it was her idea, Sarai was immediately jealous. Shortly after this, God clarified to Abram some key elements of the covenant. First of all, their names would change. Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Uh, okay. Second, Abraham must circumcise himself, the men of his household, and all of his male descendants. Mm. Okay. This was the first time the word circumcision had been used, let alone the act. So naturally, God had to provide Abraham with a short tutorial. As with every new surgical method, the first few procedures were touch and go. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> In turn, God promised to fulfill God's part of the covenant, stating that Sarah would have a son. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In one year's time, God's promise was fulfilled. The now profoundly old couple named their son Isaac. It was a joyous occasion. However, Isaac's birth created new complications. Hmm. Sarah told Abraham to get rid of Hagar and her son Ishmael, for he would not share in Isaac's inheritance. Abraham attempted to save the situation, but Sarah was adamant. <sighs> okay. Abraham tried to explain the situation to Hagar and Ishmael. Hmm. The Lord assured Abraham that Ishmael would be provided for, that the son of his maidservant would become a nation as well. But the Lord's reassurance did little to lighten Abraham's heart. When Isaac was 12, the Lord instructed Abraham to take his beloved son to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Okay. Uh. Golly, are we going camping, Dad? Oh, I get it. You're building an altar for sacrifice. But, Dad, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? 
<laughs> Between his bewildering sobs, Abraham explained to Isaac that God would provide a lamb for sacrifice. Oh, wow, Dad. That looks pretty sharp. At the last possible moment, the Lord intervened and told Abraham not to lay a hand upon the boy. Okay. Woo! Okay. Abraham confirmed his faith. He had withheld nothing from the Lord, not even his beloved son. Gee willikers, Dad, a ram. Can we sacrifice it? Oh, okay, okay. Okay. And as the Lord promised, the descendants of Abraham spread throughout the land, numbering greater than the stars, and all nations were blessed through his offspring.